Hey guys, I found this interesting uh, visualization. It's called uh, visualcapitalist.com. And then I search for all the world's money and markets in one visualization 2022. Again, that's visualcapitalist.com and then backslash all dash of dash the dash worlds dash money dash and dash uh, markets dash in dash one uh, o n e dash visualization dash 2022 but anyway uh, one square is a hundred billion dollars <clears throat> so this is just kind of interesting to look at. Um, you got the, all the world's currency, uh, the world's gold jewelry, gold bars, central banks, the world's billionaires, central bank balance sheets, the S&P 500, and then everyone else. U.S. and China GDP, the global money supply, the U.S. stock market, the NASDAQ, the world stock market, the global debt, Governments, financial sector, household. Then we got real estate, which is estimated at three hundred twenty-six trillion. It says China represents a third of the total real estate. Agriculture, commercial, North America global wealth, European global wealth, China. China, Asia Pacific, India, Latin America, Africa. And then we got something called derivatives. According to the BIS, the market value derivatives is now 12.4 trillion. What is a derivative? A derivative, um, Warren Buffett would, would say that a derivative is weapons of mass destruction. A derivative is a contract between two or more parties that derives its value from the performance of an underlying asset index or entity. Derivatives are typical uh, measured in two different ways, gross market value or uh, notional value. The notional value of derivatives is now estimated to be $600 trillion. Examples of derivatives, future contracts, forward contracts, options, warrants, and swaps. And look at this. We just keep on going. Keep on going. But yeah, that's the derivatives market. Um, there was this article that came out recently. It's under BIS.org. And um, it says bank positions and FX swaps. Insights from CLS. So if you're interested in diving more into this, uh, this is a... Uh, and I just googled it just google bank positions and FX swaps and it'll pop up but this is very dangerous um, to have 
this amount of money in derivatives six hundred trillion dollars and a lot of this is off the balance sheet But you can imagine how dangerous this is to have uh, six hundred trillion dollars in derivatives. The thoughtful features built into QuickBooks Online really supports me in staying organized, managing invoices and cash flow, and just keeps me up to date. Uh, hi, Mr. Buckman, Mr. Munger. This is uh, Whitney Tilson, a shareholder from New York. Uh, for many years, both of you have been warning about the dangers of derivatives, uh, at one point calling them financial weapons of mass destruction. Uh, yet every year, tens of trillions of dollars of derivatives are, are bought and sold. Uh, it just seems to be getting bigger and bigger and almost uh, certainly improperly accounted for. And so I was wondering if you could comment uh, it, it specifically if you have any thoughts on how much longer this might go on. Do you see anything imminent uh, that could uh, derail this ever-inflating bubble? Uh, what might trigger it? And uh, who should be doing what to try and mitigate uh, this looming danger? Well, we've tried to do a little to mitigate it ourselves by talking about it, but the, uh, you're right. The, and it isn't the derivative itself. I mean, there's nothing evil about a derivative instrument. As I mentioned, we, we have 60 some of them at, at Berkshire, and on Monday I will go over the directors, with the directors, I'll go over all 60 some, and believe me, we'll make money out of those particular instruments. Uh, but the usage of them on an expanding basis, more and more imaginative ways of using them, introduces essentially more and more leverage uh, into the system and it's an invisible or largely invisible sort of leverage. Now, if you go back to the 1920s uh, after the crash the United States government held hearings they decided that leverage margin in those days as they call it, leverage contributed to perhaps the crash itself and certainly to the extent of the crash and it was like pouring gasoline on a fire was when uh, people's holdings got tripped you know when stocks went down 10 percent people had to sell and another 10 percent more people had to sell and so on so leverage was regarded as dangerous and the federal and the united states government empowered the federal reserve to regulate margin requirements regulate leverage and that was taken very seriously. And for decades, it was a, a source of real attention. If you went to a bank and tried to borrow money on a stock, they made you sign certain papers as to that you weren't in violation of the margin requirements, and they policed it. And it was taken quite seriously when the Fed increased or decreased margin requirements. It was a signal of how uh, they felt about the level of speculation. Well, the introduction of, of um, derivatives uh, and index future, all that sort of thing, uh, has just totally made any regulation of margin requirements uh, a joke. They still exist, and the, the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an anachronism. Um, so 
I believe, I think Charlie probably agrees with me, that we may not know where exactly the danger begins and where and at what point it becomes a super danger and so on. We certainly don't know what will end it precisely. We don't know when it will end precisely. But we probably, at least I believe, that it will go on and increase to the point where at some point uh, there'll be some very unpleasant things happen in markets because of it. You saw one example uh, of what can happen under forced sales uh, back in October 19, 1987, when you had so-called portfolio insurance. Well, now portfolio insurance, and you ought to go back and read the literature for the couple of years preceding that. I mean, this was something that came out of academia and it was regarded as a great advance in financial theories and everything. It was a joke. It was a bunch of stop loss orders, which, you know, go back 150 years or something, except that they were done automatically and in large scale by institutions and they were merchandise. People paid a lot of money to people to teach them how to put in a stop loss order. And what happened, of course, was that if you have a whole series of stop loss orders by very big institutions, you are pouring gasoline on, on fire. And when October 19th came along, you had a 22% shrink in the value of American business caused essentially by a doomsday machine, a dead hand was selling as each level got hit. And three weeks earlier, you know, people were proclaiming the, the beauty of this. Well, that is nothing compared, it's, it was a formal arrangement to have these this dynamic hedging or portfolio insurance uh, sell things. But you have the same thing existing when you have fund operators operating with billions and in aggregate trillions of dollars leveraged who will respond to the same st stimulus. They have what is, they have what we would call a crowded trade, but they don't know it. It's not a formal crowded trade. It's just that they're all ready to sell if a certain given signal or a certain given activity occurs. And when you get that coupled with extreme leverage, which derivatives allow, you will someday get a very, very chaotic situation. I have no idea when, I have no idea what the exogenous factor. I didn't know that shooting some archduke, you know, would start World War I, and I have no idea what will cause this kind of a thing, uh, but it'll happen. Yeah, and of course the, the accounting being deficient enormously contributes to the risks. If you get paid enormous bonuses based on reporting profits that don't exist, you're going to keep doing whatever causes those phony profits to keep appearing on the books. And what makes that so difficult is that most of the accounting profession doesn't even recognize how stupidly it is behaving. And one of the people in charge of accounting standards said to me, well, this is better this derivative accounting because it's marked to market and don't we want current information? And I said, yes, but if you mark to model and, and you create the models and your accountants trust your models and you can just report whatever profit you want as long as you keep expanding the positions bigger and bigger and bigger, the way human nature is that will cause terrible results and terrible behavior. And this person said to me, well, you just don't understand accounting. If four years ago or whenever it was when we started to liquidate Henry's portfolio, we, we had a, we had reserves set up for in the hundreds of millions with, and all sorts, sorts of things. And our auditor, and I emphasize any other of the big four auditors, absolutely would have attested to the fact that our stuff was marked to market. You know, I just wish I'd sold the portfolio to the auditors that day. <laughs> I'd be 400 million better off. Uh, so it, it's a real problem. Now there's one thing that's really quite interesting to me. You know, if, if I owe you on my dry cleaning bill or something, $15 and they're auditing the dry cleaners, they check with me and they find out that I owe you $15 and it's all fine. If they're auditing me, they find out that I owe the dry cleaner 15 bucks. There are only four big auditing firms, you know, basically in this country. And I will, 
and in, so in many cases, if they're auditing my sh side of the derivative transaction, you know, what I'm valuing it at, they, the same firm may often be value, valuing or attesting to the value of the, of the mark by the person on the other side of the contract. I will guarantee you that if you add up the marks on both sides, they don't, they don't equate out to zero. We, we have 60 some contracts, you know, and I will bet that people are valuing them differently on the other side than we value them themselves. And it won't be to the disadvantage of the trader on the other side. Uh, I don't get paid based on how ours are valued, so I've got no reason to want to game the system. But there are people out on the other side that do have reasons to game the system. So if I'm valuing some contract at plus a million dollars for Berkshire, that contract on the other side is just one piece of paper. It should be valued at a minus one million by somebody else. But I think you probably have cases, and this is I'm not talking about our auditors, I'm talking about all four of the firms. But they have many cases where they are attesting to values that, of the exact same piece of paper where the numbers are widely different on both sides. Do you have any thoughts on that, Charlie? Well, I, it sure as God made little green apples, this is going to cause a lot of trouble in due course. As long as it keeps expanding and ballooning and so on and the convulsions are minor, it can just go on and on. But eventually, there will be a big, a big uh, denouement. There you go, guys. Thanks for watching.